while Judge Kavanaugh comes up, I should tell you, uh, there's hardly anything that the president of the American Law Institute gets to do on her own. Everything is approved by a lot of different people, and in my case, that's probably a good thing. But the one thing that you do have an opportunity to do uh, is make the selection of the people who will speak at our annual meeting. I thought on our 90th anniversary that it would be particularly good for us to have somebody relatively new to the bench, uh, someone in our terms relatively new in the profession because after all, we're used to having people, not Carolyn, but are like 93-year-old uh, treasurers and, and uh, when somebody becomes emeritus, it just means that they've been on the council, I think, for 26 years. Now we have a 15-year uh, term limit, which is sort of shocking to us. And in asking around, um, as I do sitting in Albuquerque looking at the Sandia Mountains, uh, for people uh, that we might address us on this important day, uh, one name kept coming to me, and that was Brett Kavanaugh from Washington, D.C. And what people said about him that I thought was so interesting, because obviously by definition everybody sitting here is really smart, uh, what kept coming to me as I was talking to people is that Judge Kavanaugh was a person of extraordinary intellect and extraordinary personal qualities. And I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for us in our 90th year uh, to someone looking at the profession of the law from a slightly different point of view than some of us. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh began his service on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in May 2006. He was elected to the American Law Institute in 2009, and he is an advisor on our Principles of Election Law Project. Uh, he graduated from Yale College. I, I have to tell you, I always remember having heard all this Harvard-Yale stuff when John Kennedy got his honorary degree uh, from Yale. He said, I have the best of all worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. Um, but. <laughs> In this case, um, Judge Kavanaugh just couldn't kick the Yale habit and stayed there uh, for law school where he was a notes editor of the Law Journal. He had an amazing series of clerkships, Walter Stapleton on the Third Circuit, then Judge Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit, and later for Justice Kennedy on the United States Supreme Court. He has worked in the government, he has worked in private practice, uh, but what is especially interesting to me, I don't know how he does it exactly, distances I know on the East Coast are a little different than they are on the West, but somehow while doing the full uh, load of his work on the court, and of course the work that we continually assign him for the ALI, uh, he has managed to teach, not as a guest, but full-term courses uh, on separation of powers at Harvard, uh, national Security and Foreign Relations at Yale, and Constitutional Interpretation at Georgetown. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please let us welcome for our 90th year celebration, our speaker, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Well, thank you, Roberta, for your uh, very generous introduction. Uh, Roberta is pretty amazing, as we all know, and her contributions to the profession uh, and to this institute are enormous and continuing, so thank you for all of that. I also want to thank Judge Paul Friedman of the District Court here in D.C., who is on the Council of the American Law Institute, for his role in my appearance here today. Paul is a great and wise judge, and among the many wonderful things I've learned as a federal judge here in D.C. is the uh, great ability to make relationships with other judges in our courthouse. And so we have this judge's lunchroom where many of the district and circuit judges eat, and Paul and I are regulars, and we talk about the events of the day and gossip about lawyers and talk about sports and what's happening on Capitol Hill, and it's all great fun. We don't talk about pending cases for obvious reasons, and, but still, after reversal of the district court, Court of Appeals judges tend to avoid the lunchroom for a few, <laughs> a few days. It's not ideal to eat lunch with someone when you've just publicly said that they abused their discretion. <laughs> so on those days, a peanut butter and jelly at the, at the desk is just fine. 
Of course, it's relative bliss on those days where the district court has been affirmed. If an appellate judge wants to be compared to Learned Hand or John Marshall, <laughs> and really, who doesn't, then those are the days to appear in the lunchroom. As Roberta and Paul know, I am humbled and honored to be with you today at the American Law Institute. This is quite simply a bedrock and essential part of the American legal system. The Institute pursues clarity about what the law is and seeks progress about what the law should be. And I'm proud to be a member of the American Law Institute. The Institute's also a model for civil discussion and debate, which is so needed uh, um, in all three branches of our federal government here in Washington. And th in thinking about civility, people ask me about how we get along on the D.C. Circuit, and we do get along. A court is like a large family. Of course, some large families are dysfunctional, but the, our, our court uh, gets along well. And I thank uh, Judge Edwards and Judge Ginsburg and Judge Sentel and now Judge Garland, our last four chief judges, for really making our court work well together. And now that Judge Garland has taken over as chief, uh, a chief from Judge Sentel, it's <laughs> nice that we don't have to wear cowboy hats to curry favor with the <laughs> chief judge any longer. Now, I compare civility in the ju ju judiciary sometimes to civility in my prior job. I worked in the White House for five and a half years, and one time I was with President Bush in Portland, Oregon, and he said to me and a few other staffers as we went through town, you know the odd thing about Portland? We said, no, what, what's that, Mr. President? He said, everyone here seems to have only one finger. <laughs> among, its, among its many virtues, the ALI helps judges stay aware of the thoughts of the bar and the academy. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to spend time with all of you at ALI events. Of course, as a cloistered appellate judge, any human contact is a good thing. <laughs> the day the president signed my commission, I immediately went up to the Supreme Court and Justice Kennedy swore me in a little private ceremony and Chief Justice Roberts was there and my family and that was it. So I was all excited and then Justice Kennedy sat me down and said, you're gonna get to your office and there's gonna be a phone and a computer and a yellow pad and no one will ever call you again. <laughs> So he told me to get out, to get involved, to teach, uh, to get involved in bar activities. And that's one of the reasons I've so enjoyed and um, was so inspired to become part of the American Law Institute. Of course, from the other direction, the, the ALI helps judges explain and demystify the judicial process to practitioners and academics. I think the law and the bar are poorly served when the judiciary is too cloistered, when the judicial process is too much of a black box. Of course, one humorous aspect, I suppose, of being a judge is how people treat you when you run into them outside of the courtroom. And what I find is this falls into two categories. Those who have known you only after you became a judge and those who knew you before you became a judge. So the people who have only known you after are very deferential and respectful, at least when you first meet them. Sometimes can almost get uncomfortable. Now, I want to hasten to add that not every judge gets uncomfortable when people fawn over them, so I don't want to discourage <laughs> such activity. But it's quite a different story with those who knew you beforehand. I would say the common reaction from old friends is amusement, and that's probably generous. When someone I'd known for a long time was arguing before me recently, I told my clerks afterwards, I said, that was a really hard argument for the person to do, and my clerks asked why, and I said, it's really hard to argue when you're thinking the whole time, I can't believe this guy is a federal judge. <laughs> now, I am a federal judge who came from the White House. I worked five and a half years before becoming a judge, and it's fair to say that certain senators were not entirely sold that that was the best launching pad for a position on the D.C. Circuit. And one senator at my hearing noted that I had worked at the White House and was still working there and said in his opening remarks, this isn't just salt in the wound, this is the whole shaker. <laughs> true story, my mom said to me at a break, uh, I guess trying to buck up her son, she came up to me and whispered to me, 
I think he really respects you. <laughs> it's always good to have mom with you at your confirmation hearings. So a few years ago when Justice Kagan was nominated to the Supreme Court, Professor Rick Pildes wrote a blog post touting the relevance of her prior White House experience back in the Clinton administration. No surprise, I, I agree. White House experience of that kind gives one extraordinary insight into the legislative process, the administrative process. You learn how the president and the presidency operates in a way that people on the outside, I don't think, can fully appreciate, even people who work in agencies. It gives you great respect for the presidency, but that doesn't translate into undue deference. Serious White House experience gives you some perspectives that might be thought counterintuitive. For one, White House experience really helps refine what one might call one's BS detector um, for determining when the executive branch might be exaggerating or misstating how things actually work or the problems that would supposedly ensue from a particular legal interpretation. Prior White House experience, I think, is also important and can be helpful to show some backbone and fortitude in the independent judiciary has to stand up to the presidency and not be intimidated by the mystique of the presidency. I think of Justice Jackson, of course, as a rough role model for us executive branch lawyers turned judges. We all walk in the long shadow of Justice Jackson. When people ask me which prior legal experience has been most useful for me as a judge, I tell them I certainly draw on all of them, the clerkships, private practice at Kirkland, independent counsel's office, even college jobs on the Hill at Ways and Means. But the five and a half years in the White House, especially the three years with President Bush, among the most interesting and most instructive. And so many memories come to mind. And, and I think about so often. I remember walking into the West Wing for the daily 810 Council's Office meeting on September 12th, 2001, and how much different that felt from going in just 24 hours earlier. I remember as Staff Secretary witnessing the President's meetings and discussion with world leaders, President Putin and President Musharraf and President Karzai and Prime Minister Blair and Pope John Paul, being at the G8 in Scotland on 7705 when the London bombings occurred participating in the process of putting legislation together, whether it was Medicare, prescription drug, or terrorism insurance, immigration reform attempts, times at the Hill in the middle of the night, the last minute negotiation sessions with the ritual and required yelling matches among congressional staffers who were sleep deprived, drafting executive orders, working on presidential speeches, and you see regulatory agencies screw up on occasion, gather that still happens on occasion. <laughs> I saw how agencies try to comply with congressional mandates. I also saw how agencies sometimes try to avoid congressional mandates. I saw the relationship and odd dances between the agencies and the White House. I saw the good and bad sides of a president trying to run for president and be president at the same time. I met Americans from all over the country, all of us did who worked there as we traveled. Families of fallen soldiers and small business owners and farmers and cops and new immigrants talked to the president and was able to participate in how, how should he pick someone for the Supreme Court. I remember a few days after Hurricane Katrina, easily the worst week that all of us experienced working in the White House. And that late that Saturday night, sitting on my couch, when Dan Bartlett, the communications director, called and said simply, Rehnquist died. Boss wants to meet at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I sat on my couch at home, just thinking about the enormity of all of that. And it was not apparent to me at the time, and I'm certainly not disinterested, but it seems to me those experiences helped make be a better student of the administrative process, a better interpreter of statutes. Now, appellate judge, completely different. As far away, as I mentioned, as you can be from the frenzied, emotional, chaotic world of a White House staffer. And I've been on the D.C. Circuit for seven years now, and after seven years, I can end the suspense and say that FERC cases are still FERC cases. <laughs> But it's a huge honor, uh, and it's a huge responsibility, and I know it has real-world consequences for the lives and liberties and property of the American people. And so in the spirit of bench and bar interaction, I thought I would touch briefly on three ideas, three issues that the combination of my experiences in the White House 
and the combination of my experiences as a judge have led me to think that judges and practitioners and academics should be thinking about. And the connective tissue to these three ideas is to help establish firmer ground rules for particular legal endeavors before those rules are applied in particular cases. A basic, as we all know, basic rule of law value and also something that helps avoid the partisan and ideological squabbling that can occur when you're trying to create the rule at the time it's being applied. So first, at least by the time the next presidency gets going, I think the confirmation process for federal court of appeals and district court judges should be fixed so that it provides for a vote within a set period of time. And why do I think that? When I worked at the White House, I worked on judicial nominations. And the breakdown in the Senate confirmation process was for lower court nominees was really in full force at that time. Nominees were held up for years without hearings or votes. Of course, much the same thing had occurred in the Clinton administration, and some of the same thing is occurring now in the Obama administration. And think about the examples of John Roberts and Elena Kagan and their stalled nominations to the D.C. Circuit. It was easier for them to get confirmed to the Supreme Court than to get confirmed for a lower court. That's crazy, but it's true. So the process for lower court nominees is too drawn out, and the delays are not right to the individual nominees, and that creates systemic effects. It, cr it deters good people from wanting to be judges. Who wants to have their private practice held up for a year or two and lose clients while they're facing an uncertain Senate confirmation uh, process? The dysfunction means that seats are vacant too long, meaning that courts are overburdened. Uh, and causes delays in our system of justice. And there's a better way, as President Clinton and President Bush both suggested, and President Bush talked about in some detail in various speeches, the executive branch and Senate should work together on ground rules that will apply no matter who is president and who controls the Senate. In other words, Democratic president, same rules as Republican president. Democratic controlled Senate, same rules as Republican controlled Senate. There are four permutations. The rules should be the same for all four permutations. So my starting suggestion would be that the Senate should require a vote on all judicial nominees within six months of nomination. It's not my place to say whether that should be the 60 vote uh, requirement or a 51 majority vote requirement, but I do think that a time limit is essential to bring to a close the process of a nomination of a federal judge. It'll help fill vacancies more quickly. It'll help encourage more good people to become uh, part of the judiciary, which the judiciary needs. I don't want to inject myself into current events, and I realize changing the rules in, a, in the middle of a presidency is sometimes skewed because incentives are skewed by, the, by the new, how the new rules would apply. But at least by the time the next presidency gets going, it's time for the executive branch and the Senate to work together to bring some regularity to those, this process. Second, most of the challenging legal issues today are questions of statutory interpretation. So we should work hard to ensure that the ground rules of statutory interpretation are as clear as possible before we must apply them in the context of controversial litigation. Now in our court, the bread and butter is to figure out uh, whether an agency exceeded its statutory authority or statutory limits. The most important factor is the pr precise wording of the statutory text. If you sat in our courtroom week for a week or two and heard case after case, and I don't advise that for anyone who wants to stay sane, but if you did that, you would hear judges across the ideological spectrum uh, asking, what does the text of the statute say? What does the text of the regulation say? Now, this is in large part attributable to the influence of Justice Scalia on statutory interpretation, but it's also because both formalists and functionalists have come to realize the centrality of text to statutory interpretation. Functionalists recognize something I saw repeatedly in the White House, that virtually all important legislation is a compromise of many competing views, and we upset that compromise when we don't follow the text. Professor John Manning of Harvard has done landmark work on that precise point. But to say that the text is important, which all judges agree on, that it's important, or that it's primary, still leaves a number of questions. How best to interpret the text? There are canons of interpretation. 
Some are semantic canons, the canon against surplusage or the justum generis canon. There are the substantive canons, such as the constitutional avoidance canon or the presumption against extraterritorial application. These canons of interpretation are hugely important to day-to-day -day statutory interpretation. Just think a few weeks ago, a huge alien tort statute case. It came down to how do you apply the presumption against extraterritorial application? Or consider the constitutional avoidance canon. Most people think that the main disagreement in the health care cases between Chief Justice Roberts and the dissenters was on the question whether the tax clause justified the individual mandate. But if you actually look at the opinion, Chief Justice Roberts agreed with the dissenters that the individual mandate provision, as written, was not justified by the tax clause. But the Chief Justice went on and said that the statute could be construed not to impose a mandate, but rather just a traditional tax incentive of the kind we have with cigarette taxes and mortgage interest deductions and the like. He relied on what? The constitutional avoidance doctrine to interpret the individual mandate that way. And the dissenters disagreed that the constitutional avoidance doctrine could be used to stretch the statute so far from its terms. For all the ink that's been spilled about the health care cases, very few people seem to appreciate the source of the main disagreement between the Chief Justice and the dissenters, how to apply the constitutional avoidance doctrine. It's, of course, better when the ground rules of statutory interpretation are fully settled ahead of time. And I want to quote someone who lamented the lack of accepted ground rules to interpret statutes. He said that statutory interpretation involves inconsistent practices on a variety of vexing questions, including, and he listed many, including, how far will we go to construe a law to avoid raising a constitutional question? And that man continued, it would help if we could have general acceptance by the bench as well as the bar of a few basic principles of statutory construction. Perhaps this institute, he said, could devise a disinterested restatement that would commend itself as an acceptable standard for enactment by Congress or for application by the courts. And that was Justice Jackson speaking to the American Law Institute in Philadelphia in May 1948. And the void identified by Justice Jackson persisted for decades and decades thereafter. And it's been filled well now, but only recently, by Justice Scalia and Brian Garner in their book last year called Reading Law, a book that really should be the sh on the shelf of every judge and every lawyer. And their extraordinary work identifies and explains 57 canons of construction. Now, this is probably obvious, but their views about how some of those canons should be applied was bound to be contested, and it has been contested as to some. Professor Bill Eskridge's recent piece in the Columbia Law Review questions a few of the canons application as discussed by uh, Scalia and Garner. And in very important new scholarship, Professor Abby Gluck of Yale Law School has pointed out that congressional staffers are attuned to some of the canons identified by, by Justice Scalia and Mr. Garner, but not to others. To take one example, courts often apply a surplusage canon that words in a statute should not be interpreted to be redundant. Turns out that members of Congress want to be redundant. <coughs> Redundancy in the words of Shakespeare helps a speaker to make double sure. <laughs> In plain English, we often use redundant words to be sure and leave no doubt. Extra credit for those who got the joke there. Anyway, and beyond that, <laughs> congressional staffers often purposely use redundant terms to make sure that all bases are covered to satisfy interest group and executive officials. So why do courts continue to use the surplusage canon? Good question. But those examples, those questions are why I think people in this room can make a difference, either individually or as part of this institute. Justice Scalia and Briner, Brian Garner have helped fill the void identified by Justice Jackson to this group in 1948. But to the extent there are lingering questions about certain canons, we should all endeavor to continue the dialogue and reach greater consensus over time. Justice Jackson said that this issue is worthy of any effort you might deem proper to make its eventual solution more likely and more immediate I agree, so I would say let's keep working to make the ground rules for statutory interpretation as clear as we can. Third and final point relates to war. 
In wartime, as in judicial confirmations, as in statutory interpretation, our system should endeavor to ensure that the legal ground rules are as clear as possible ahead of time. Perhaps the most significant cases that come before our court, before any court, are those that involve the national security and foreign policy of the United States. In many cases, however, the question really boils down to, has the executive branch acted consistently with a statute? And the courts have an important role in those cases, as the Supreme Court has made clear from Youngstown to Boumediene to a decision on the political question doctrine a year ago in Zivotofsky. Some, of course, have argued that even if the courts are involved, there should be extreme deference to the executive. But at least in cases where statutes are involved and there is a plaintiff withstanding, excessive deference to the executive actually means overriding the will of Congress, something that was recognized by the court in Zivotofsky. And therefore, it would upset the balance of powers among the branches for a court to simply give a blank check to the executive in those cases. That's the lesson of Justice Jackson's opinion in Youngstown. It's a lesson of the Supreme Court's 2006 decision in Hamdan. Courts generally apply ordinary principles of statutory interpretation even in wartime cases. What this means, obviously, is that statutes are very important to the executive's wartime decisions, something Professor Jack Goldsmith of Harvard has pointed out. Statutes, contrary to the common belief, or some common belief, statutes really are prevalent in regulating various aspects of war, from detention to interrogation to surveillance to military commissions. And given that wartime decisions are life, but life or death, it's especially important in this area for Congress to write the rules clearly and to update them to make them more clear when necessary, and then for courts to interpret the laws according to settled and consistent principles of interpretation. Not always possible, obviously, to achieve that objective on all fronts, but it is certainly possible to try, and all of us who have roles in the legal system should be working to that end. So in closing, having mentioned war, and knowing this is the American Law Institute, we don't dwell on it, but we are a nation at war with great challenges for the legal system. When I worked at the White House, I saw the difficulty of the job of president, who has a particularly important role, obviously, in wartime. I'm aware of that responsibility and the burden that comes with it. Before his 2004 address at the nominating convention in New York, President Bush was doing a last run-through that afternoon in the hotel room of his speech. As I recall, there are a few people in the room, Mike Gerson, Dan Bartlett, myself, and the speech was pretty well locked down. The president was just doing a last practice run to make sure everything was exactly as he wanted it. And we were all reading our drafts on paper as he was reading it out loud. And anyway, towards the end of the speech, there was a passage that read as follows. I've held the children of the fallen who are told their dad or mom is a hero, but rather just have their dad or mom. I've met with parents and wives and husbands who have received a folded flag and said a final goodbye to a soldier they loved. And as President Bush finished reading that sentence in the hotel room, there was a pause. And after a few seconds, I looked up, all of us did, as we were reading the speech, and President Bush had stopped because he was choking up. And of course, being President Bush, he immediately said, don't worry, I'll, get it, I'll straighten it out tonight. But in that moment, and in so many others, I remember thinking of the enormity of the responsibility the president carries. I always think of that when I observe President Bush. And I always think of that when I observe President Obama. I thought of that in Dallas a few weeks ago when I saw five presidents, the five living presidents, on a stage at the Bush Library. So seeing that, I will think always that what unites us in America is far greater than what divides us. Thank you.